Jesus is King. Welcome back to the Lay Apostolate on the Meaning of Catholic. And I'm very happy to jo be joined by my friend, Dr. Scott Hahn. Dr. Hahn, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Timothy. It's great to see you. I recognize that uh, studio uh, down in your basement. Uh, yes. A year ago and sure enjoyed it. Yeah, it was great to have you over uh, last year. So if you don't know Dr. Scott Hahn, he is the founder and president of the St. Paul Center, an apostolate dedicated to teaching Catholics to read scripture from the heart of the church. He also serves as the Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology and New Evangelization at Franciscan University of Steubenville, where he has taught since 1990. An exceptionally popular speaker and teacher, Dr. Hahn has delivered numerous talks nationally and internationally on a wide variety of topics related to scripture and the Catholic faith. His talks have been effective in helping thousands of Protestants and fallen away Catholics to embrace the Catholic faith. Dr. Hahn has been married to Kimberly for 45 years. They have six children and 23 grandchildren. One of their sons, Father Jeremiah, is a priest ordained to the Diocese of Steubenville, Ohio. As the author or editor of over 40 popular and academic books, Dr. Hahn's works include best-selling titles like Rome Sweet Home, The Lamb's Supper, Hail Holy Queen, and The Fourth Cup. His most recent releases are titled Holy is His Name and Catholics in Exile, Biblical Wisdom for the Journey Home, now available at stpaulcenter.com. And I want to congratulate you for this incredible achievement, Dr. Hahn. It's the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. Congratulations, Dr. Hahn. Thank you, Timothy. It's uh, been a quarter of a century in the making, actually 26 years to be more precise. It was a labor of love that uh, I gave consent to 26 years ago when Father Fessio asked me to do it. But honestly, I would never have been able to do it apart from Curtis Mitch. He was uh, a graduate student at the time. He was living with us. And then he got married to Stacy, and he agreed to do this project, even though he knew it would take at least 20 years. But honestly, I had such trust in him, his discipline, his work ethic, but also his knowledge. I'd gotten to the point where even though he was a, a grad student, got his MA, studied with me, you know, he could finish my sentences, but even more, he could assess my own interpretive judgments and opinions. And I trusted him perhaps slightly more than I trusted myself. And so uh, I said to Father Fessio, if you hire Curtis Mitch, sight unseen, trust me, we're going to be able to make headway and get this project complete. And so thanks be to God, not only for Curtis, but also for the team of uh, the team of specialists that we were able to assemble to make it so that the Old Testament would get done. Because your, you know, our viewers might know this, but in 2010, the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible New Testament was complete. And we, we'd been working on it at that point for about, oh, 13 years. But the Old Testament is such a heavier lift. And so we got a number of people, Michael Barber in particular, John Bergsma, as well as Jeffrey Morrow, Mark Gieshak, David Twelman, Andre Vilnev, and the list goes on and on. And I probably shouldn't have started the list because I knew I might forget somebody. So apologies to whoever I didn't name. But what an amazing work this was. And what an amazing gift it will be, I think, for a, not just a new generation, but for generations wow. to come. I want to just show our audience what this tool looks like and how they can get it and how they can use it as well. And I look forward to people getting it, but I also want to invite them to share with us their initial impressions as they begin to use it. I'm grateful to Father Fessio, to Curtis Mitch, and to countless others for making the impossible something that is now accomplished. Yeah, we're, and we're so thankful. This is such a great gift to the church. It's so exciting. So click the link below, go to St. Paul Center, order the order the, your copy, and... You can get one for yourself. So this is a part of, um, let me just explain re really quick before we start talking more about that, is that this whole series, The Lay Apostolate, is about promoting lay reading of the Holy Scripture. We have our lay Bible reader group where we go through the entire Bible every year according to a liturgical schedule. It's a great time to join it because we're restarting the church here, obviously, with Advent, where we read through Isaiah and the Book of Wisdom. And then it's traditional to follow the Pauline epistles through Epiphany Tide. And then at, at right before Lent, you start the Torah. So you go through the, all the Torah during Lent. So you can join that at meaningofcatholic.com slash register. 
chip into the apostolate and then you can join the Bible reading group. So I've got, so I have some questions from our guild members. I'm also teaching a high school course on the Bible. And I have some questions from our high schoolers. And so I want to start, uh, Dr. Han, with kind of situating this text that you've just released in the history of modern Catholic biblical studies. I have a question from Rachel and Andy, who are both kind of talking about modern historical biblical criticism, which seems to be kind of the, the main question that arises in the late 19th century. Is this something that the church can use? If so, how? Uh, so can you place, how does this text, this new study Bible, fit into this modern history of trying to answer this question? Well, historical criticism is something I've written a fair bit about. Uh, in particular, a book called Politicizing the Bible, The Roots of Historical Criticism and the Secularization of Scripture from 1300 to 1700 with Dr. Benjamin Weicker. And we look at historical criticism as really a philosophical approach to studying history, studying texts. And we will discover that historical criticism is methodologically designed so that it only looks at the natural, not the supernatural, the human, not the divine, the scientific, but no room for the miraculous or elements of prophecy. So in some ways it's useful, very useful, when you're looking at the natural, social, historical, and linguistic elements of sacred scripture. But on the other hand, if you're looking for something to help you identify the truth of the word of God, you're looking to a tone deaf music critic or a colorblind you know, art critic because uh, historical criticism, not accidentally but deliberately, is incapable of achieving conclusions when it comes to the divine, the supernatural, the miraculous, and so on. Uh, and so while we draw from the results of historical criticism here in the footnotes, nothing depends upon it and nothing is really drawn from it in the reductionistic way. In fact, it's historical criticism that caused me to say yes back in December of 1997 when Father Fessio had first uh, approached me about working on this massive project. The New American Bible was out, the St. Joseph edition, which was a study Bible. And practically in every third or fourth page, you would see questions and doubts expressed almost as certitude when it came to the miraculous, when it came to the difficult passages, when it came to apparent contradictions. I won't go through many of the examples that I've touched upon in the past with my grad students, but it was so frustrating. And even another study Bible came out uh, from Europe in Spanish, and I read it expecting to be impressed and expecting to see a kind of counterbalance, but instead the notes were full of historical critical conclusions as well that cast doubts on many of the things that uh, from a Catholic perspective we would not doubt. And so the week before I had seen that, and so the week after when Father Fessu asked me, I said, I can do this, but I need help because I'm too busy to do this alone. I'm really too busy to do most of the lifting. And so when we were able to get Curtis Mitch, who was trained not only in Greek and Hebrew, but other things as well, he knew historical criticism. He knew the historical critical methods of source, form, and redaction criticism, but he also knew the limitations of those methods. And so uh, this is what I would say is so crucial. Now, I want to point out something else, that in the Protestant world, the notion of a study Bible is something of a commonplace. I mean, going all the way back to... Uh, Protestantism in its origins. You had the Geneva Study Bible that came as a result of John Calvin's influence, and it was widely used in England and throughout Europe, and even in the States, I suspect, before we were states and still colonies. But more recently, you had the Schofield Reference Bible right. from Oxford in the 1890s that became the best-selling version. You have the uh, Harper Study Bible that I was using back in the 70s. Yeah, Harold Linsell did that, the Charles Ryrie Study Bible, the John MacArthur Study Bible. You have apologetic study Bibles. You have biblical theology, systematic theology, study Bibles, the cultural background study Bible, uh, so many others, literally dozens and dozens. And so Protestants have often drawn from these study Bibles, especially when it comes to their own denominational backgrounds and traditions, because the footnotes all reinforce them. Now, we have the obligation, we've got the responsibility to really be Catholic, 
So we dive into the patristic as well as the medieval and the magisterial. But we also look at the geography. We look at the cultural background. But there is admittedly a strong apologetic emphasis. That is when it comes to the Eucharist, when it comes to Mary, the Pope, purgatory, all seven sacraments, and why we have saints in this sort of thing, and the communion of saints. This is not an apologetic study Bible, though. Uh, if people have used the New Testament, that is the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible New Testament, they already have a clear sense that what we're doing is applying the principles of Dei Verbum, uh, that is the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation from Vatican II. Without getting tangled up in the weeds here, there are three principles, three criteria. The first one is the content and unity of all of Scripture. So whenever we're looking at a passage, we're always looking at the larger context, going all the way to the canon of Scripture. The second one is the living tradition. That is, how have these passages been understood down through the ages? And likewise, the third one is the analogy of faith. That is, how do these passages lead us to the doctrine that we have been taught? And how do the doctrines clarify or illuminate these passages? There's so much more, but I mean, 2,300 pages, it's nearly six pounds. We have over 18,000 uh, footnotes, along with dozens of essays and all kinds of maps, charts, and diagrams to make this a lifelong investment, but really more than just a, an investment of money. It's a, it's a lifelong investment of time and energy. And so uh, there you have it. And it fits right into the mission of the St. Paul Center for Biblical yeah. Theology. Uh, biblical literacy for lay people, biblical fluency for the clergy, but reading scripture from the heart of the church. And so we have a spectrum. And in a certain sense, this is the centerpiece of the spectrum because beginners can pick this up and find answers to their questions. Scholars and professors I know through the years have used this not only in preparing their lectures, but also as a textbook for undergraduates, for graduate students as well. And so the utility of this, I think, it's extraordinarily functional for prayer, for study, for teaching, and for so much more. And so I am proud of our Lord for getting us through it, but I'm most especially proud of Curtis Mitch and the team that we assembled and all of the hard work that went into this. Wonderful. Thanks be to God. Well, I, I wanted to share with you a, a, a timeline that I tried to construct based on your work and some of my own research here. And I, I wanted to know how you thought about this to kind of break down some of the modern controversies that you just mentioned. Uh, so you mentioned, you know, obviously we have the Protestant revolt, which sort of undermines, but also promotes more scripture studies. And then you have the politicizing of the Bible in the enlightenment politicizing with this historical critical method. And then we have modern biblical criticism as in the late 19th century, where Loazi is condemned but Leo the Thirteenth approves sort of a cautious use of the biblical criticism. But there seems to be a sea change, and I'm interested to hear what you th think about this with Pius the Twelfth, with Cardinal Bia, where they promote a much more optimistic view of historical biblical criticism, uh, translations quote from the original language, utilizing the Masoretic Hebrew uh, over against other traditions, uh, and Vatican II also promotes a cossage use, but there seems to be sort of this floodgate of, of a neo-modernist or historical materialistic view, as you said, with all these study Bibles. And it seems like Joseph Ratzinger tries to pull it back and tries to really criticize uh, a too much optimism about that usage, which later leads to Liturgium Authenticum in 2001, which is what led to the NRSV second Catholic edition after that document. And then we have the Ignatius Study Bible, which seems to really put it together and uh, so what do you think of this kind of breakdown uh, of the different waves of controversy here? Well, I think it's very helpful, and I'm grateful to you, Timothy, for providing it because uh, it covers a lot of ground. And though I might fine-tune or tweak an element or two, I would say it's accurate. Uh, I also had mentioned that besides the book Politicizing the Bible that you have there that goes from 1300 to 1700, the breakthrough for me, for Dr. Weicker as well, was to find that historical criticism is originating not in the 17th century, like most scholars would say, the 1600s. It really originates in the 14th and 15th centuries leading up to the, Refor the Reformation or the Protestant Revolt in the 16th century. Uh, the other thing, too, that I would point out that even though Volume 1 ends in around uh, 1700, Volume 2 
that Dr. Jeffrey Morrow and I have co-authored that Emmaus Academic has published, Modern Biblical Criticism as a Tool of Statecraft. That is the second volume, and that basically goes from 1700 to 1900, and it just shows how politically useful biblical criticism is to advance the secular agendas of these national governments, in Europe especially, but also even in America. We're working on a third volume, focusing on the Catholic use of biblical criticism in the 20th century, focusing on scholars like Father Raymond Brown, as well as John J. Collins and others too. Uh, a lot of it is useful. Some of it, I think, is dangerous in a way that is subtle. Um, and so it, uh, uh, one other thing I want to say, though, um, that when you look at Leo Thirteenth back in 1893, Providentissimus Deus doesn't really approve the cautious use of modern biblical criticism. What Leo endorses is the proper use of criticism rightly understood. So it is textual criticism. Uh, it is not um, what we would identify as historical criticism. You have to do a close reading of Providentissimus to see that. And even in 1943, 50 years after Providentissimus came out from, uh, from Leo XIII, when Pius XII is writing uh, Divino Aflante Spiritu, even there, there is a fine distinction between criticism properly understood without any philosophical bias. And that's the key, because in the Catholic tradition, you always begin with the perennial philosophy, which shows that the intellect is adequate to understand reality. And so metaphysics, the existence of God, his attributes, his providence, as well as the natural moral law, these are all of the things that are excluded by historical criticism. But when you use the word criticism and you understand it properly in our tradition, you can apply it cautiously as long as you distinguish. And so uh, I won't get more into this. We can do it perhaps in another, in another conversation. But I would say the idea, there are two narratives. I think one is a counterfeit narrative. That would say Providentissimus is somewhat strict and reactionary. And then in 1943, Pius XII, Divino Aflante Spiritu, that's the Magna Carta. The irony is that in Divino, Pope Pius XII describes Providentissimus as, quote, the Magna Carta oh, of okay. Catholic biblical scholarship. And so to you know, make it one versus the other subverts the plain sense of what Pius XII is saying in 1943. Again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the fact that we might lose a lot of our, our viewers, and I apologize for that. But all of these issues went into my own prayerful discernment and decision as to why to go about working on this Ignatius Catholic Study Bible with kindred spirits, with like-minded scholars who recognize the limited value of historical criticism and the virtually unlimited abuses of historical criticism. And so if you subordinate the critical methods to a hermeneutic of faith, precisely as Pope Benedict emphasized, then I think you can find, you know, it's sort of like you can detoxify it. You can take what is useful and leave behind the things that might be dangerous. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Hunt. Here's, a, here's a, some questions from my high school students. Here, this comes from Therese. She says, what parts of the Bible do you enjoy most and why? <laughs> oh, that's sort of like asking me, what, which of my 23 grandkids do I love the most? <laughs> I'd have to say whichever one happens to be in my lap, like last night after dinner. Uh, I would say the favorite book of mine is the book of Hebrews. Admittedly, it might be the single most difficult of the 27 books of the New Testament. But part of the difficulty is its extensive use of the Old Testament. And the book of Hebrews proved to be a sort of challenge for me in seminary, but I accepted the challenge and sort of allowed that book, perhaps more than any other, to reconfigure my understanding of all of salvation history, the unity of God's fatherly plan, also known as the divine economy. But it's a unity in distinction. You distinguish the Old Testament from the new, but not to divide them. Like Luther would say, it's law versus gospel. You unite them, but you unite them by subordinating the old to the new so that you discover the new was concealed in the old and the old is revealed and fulfilled by the new. But there's also something else in Hebrews. And really it's there throughout all of Paul's letters, throughout all four gospels. 
And that is the element that, uh, it's called mystagogy, but that's sort of a little bit like jargon. Uh, mystagogy is defined in the catechism, I believe, paragraph 1075, as moving from the visible to the invisible, from the human to the divine, from the, uh, from the sacrament, the visible sign, to the mystery, the invisible reality. And so what you discover is what the disciples discovered on the road to Emmaus, that their hearts were burning within them as this apparent stranger opened the scriptures. And then suddenly at the table in Emmaus, he took, he blessed, he broke, he gave. And then that Eucharistic Eureka moment comes and they see the resurrected Lord and he disappears because he was made known in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread. And so it shows us that the fulfillment of the old by Christ in the new didn't end on Good Friday. It didn't even end on Easter Sunday. That by the power of the Holy Spirit, working through the sacraments, Christ is still fulfilling the old, reproducing his own life, his love, his divine sonship in us, especially via the sacraments. And this is, to me, the best way to read Scripture so that you're hearing the living voice of your Father in heaven showing you that Christ is present, not only in the Eucharist, but within our hearts. And he's conforming us to Christ through our love and our obedience, our hard work, but also especially through our suffering as well. Question from Sarah. She's asking about the different versions of the translation of the Bible. Can you comment on pluses and minuses of different translations? Um, are all translations created equal? What are your thoughts on translations? So I do believe that uh, the RSVCE2 is the most reliable of the versions that are out there right now. Uh, having said that, I also want to acknowledge that the New American Bible is a sort of monopoly. That is because the USCCB authorized the translation and profits from the sales. It's the only one that can be read in the Catholic Mass and the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And so we have that disadvantage. We're sort of left outside. And yet at the same time, I think we we find that even people who were working on the New American Bible for the USCCB admit that at many points, perhaps more, you have uh, the RSV CE, that is the Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition, uh, ed number two, the second edition. Uh, it is a more reliable translation. Excellent. And I should, Matt, I should also add that um, in the last... 50, 60, 70 years, especially since the catechism was promulgated in the early 90s, typology, that is the, uh, the uh, investigation and the concerted effort to discover the relationship between the old and the new. So Melchizedek, the Passover lamb and all of this, you see how the new is concealed in the old and the old is revealed and fulfilled in the new, as Augustine put it. But this is probably the most important contribution that the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible has made. And as I mentioned, we began more than 25 years ago. Uh, we started the St. Paul Center uh, 22 years ago, and Curtis Mitch was a founding board member. And we saw this project as something of a sort of a flagship for us. And so even though Ignatius Press did it, we didn't own at the time Emmaus Road Publishing, uh, but we're grateful and proud of the partnership and also of the many people who put a lot of time and energy, Mark Brumley especially, and a number of other folks as well. Excellent. Here's a question from our guild member, Wesley. He says, which books of the Old Testament were most challenging to provide commentary for? And are there any additions to the New Testament commentary that was previously published? There were slight additions to the New Testament, but there are a number of challenges in the Old Testament. I'm thinking especially of, of Judith, of, of Maccabees as well. And so you have Tobit, uh, the deuterocanonical books. There's such a w wide range of opinion, and there's such a deep distrust in the historicity of things like Judith as well as Jonah. And so we had to, we, we had to address a lot of questions, sometimes objections, and do it in a way that was even handed and not just simply pointing to the past and saying that's good enough. Yeah. We really do want to respond to contemporary scholarship and to the issues that are raised. Excellent. Here's a question from one of my high school students, Catherine. She says, how does the book of wisdom point us to and fulfill salvation history? Wow. Well, I mean, first of all, wisdom chapters one to six 
is like an advanced portrait or a foreshadowing of Jesus, the righteous man who knows that he's the son of God, trusts God as his father, and is beset and, uh, you know, not only tormented, but dies and then is vindicated. Uh, but then when you look at wisdom seven through nine, you see from Solomon this, in, this, this insight into divine wisdom, into the Holy Spirit. And then when you get to wisdom 10 through 13, you basically have a summary synthesis of salvation history, focusing especially upon the Exodus and how God drove the people out of the promised land little by little and how God taught his own children little by little. And I think it's just a, an example of how much you can get out of the Old Testament when you're reading from the perspective of the New Testament. Excellent. Yeah, that, that's what we, we read Isaiah in Advent as well, and also the Book of Wisdom. Um, so I've got two questions from Timothy. The first one is, which you kind of touched on, but it's how are we to understand Scripture through the lens of scriptural inerrancy, especially as it relates to matters of history, science, archaeology, related to us through the Bible? Well, the church's teaching on inerrancy has been constant. And when you get a proper translation of Dei Verbum, uh, section 11 in chapter 3, you see that it hasn't deviated in any way. It hasn't been compromised. It hasn't been even diluted. The problem is so many of the English translations of Dei Verbum, article 11, were mistranslated or translated in a kind of confusing or mischievous way. Uh, but at the end of the day, what you will find is the church's teaching on inerrancy is constant and it's also grounded so that whatever is affirmed by the human writers is also affirmed by the Holy Spirit. So since God cannot err or teach error, then we know that it is without error as long as it's properly interpreted. And that really is the crux of the matter. That is, you have inspiration that leads to inerrancy, but that cries out for proper interpretation. And that is really where the study Bible comes in. But it's not just, you know, sort of like following the guidelines. There really is a sense in which you have to see that there are other books that are not inspired, that are presumably carefully written and edited, that are without error. At least I'd like to think that at least one of my 50 plus books might be without error, especially the children's books that have come out recently. But that wouldn't imply that it's inspired. So inspiration has as its negative byproduct the preservation from error. But what is the positive point? What is the constructive contribution? Well, it's there in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, 21, where you see that not only does Scripture have a section that we call the prophets, but all of Scripture is prophecy. So that you have the human writers communicating the truth as they understand it, but they're also empowered by the Holy Spirit. As hagiographers, they're prophets. Some prophets like Elijah never wrote a book of the Bible. Other prophets who are not predicting the coming of the Messiah are nevertheless endowed with this. So for example, in Acts 2, in his sermon at Pentecost, Peter refers to David, the author of Psalm 16, as a prophet. And this becomes one of the most important prophecies, Psalm 16, about the resurrection. And so you discover that, you know, the, the Bible is not just a map where you can kind of run your hand over it and get a sense of the land. It really is something that has the terrain. There is a third dimension that God brings because the hagiographer was not just giving a human perspective, but endowed with the charism of prophecy. They're giving us something that goes beyond the merely natural, the merely human, to something supernatural and truly divine. And again, that's an important emphasis in the study Bible. It's inspired, it's inerrant, but we have to recognize that interpretation is the principal task, but it's not just looking at what the human authors understand. As Augustine points out in the Catechism quotes him, the Holy Spirit is the principal author. And it isn't the case that we have the human authors only saying this much, and then the divine author, the Holy Spirit, picks up where he leaves off. No, there is an interpenetration of the two, but it calls for what St. Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 14 as a, a gift of, of prophecy on the one hand and a gift of interpretation. And I think this is what we'll discover as we dive more deeply into the living tradition, and then we come up, we surface with these insights that are continually developing over, over time. Excellent. Thank you for 
the, that answer, Dr. Hanna. So I got one more question for you. It's also from our guild member, Timothy. He says, if biblical typology is the Old Testament pointing towards Christ's first coming, is there another typology which points towards his second coming or a typology in the church that points back towards Christ? So he, he gives an example. He's saying, here's an example would be that the church will go through her own passion and death, united in us to Christ crucified before Christ returns. So is there this additional typology that sort of points into church history? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, the answer is yes. And the catechism is clear that in as much as the church is the mystical body of Christ, and that's more than a, a figure of speech or a metaphor, that is a mystery, but there is something metaphysically real about the union of Christ the head with the church as the mystical body and all of us as members. And so the triumph of the church is going to mirror the triumph of Christ. He didn't just simply experience political ascendancy so that Caesar stepped off his chair and allowed Christ to be the king of kings. No, it's precisely through the pastoral mystery of his own suffering, death, and resurrection. And if that's true in the first century, it's not only going to be true at the end of time, it's going to be true throughout history, that the mystical body of Christ is going to undergo suffering, affliction, persecution, and vindication. And so we can expect the church to manifest the triumph of Christ at the same time, the church is going to experience the suffering of Christ. In fact, I should mention this because in addition to the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, which will, I think, bless you for years and years and years of study and prayerful reading, I have another tool that is designed more for the beginner or more just for the ordinary lay Catholic. It's entitled Breaking the Bread for obvious reasons. Emmaus Road. Our hearts were burning within us as he opened the scriptures, but the eyes of faith are open in the breaking of the bread. And so I have two volumes that are basically designed for lay people. And I mean, these would fit inside of Kimberly's purse. And this one, the green one is for year B, which is just wrapping up. And this one, year C, is for the year of Luke. And so for all of the Sundays of year C, I show how strategically selected all of the Old Testament readings are especially in relationship to the gospel, to show that the pattern of promise and fulfillment is there to make these connections, but also to make applications. And the beautiful thing about this book is the uh, not simply the reflections that I share, but the beauty of the sacred art, as well as the material from the catechism, to show that typology is there every Sunday, and it's readily accessible, even though most priests did not learn typology in seminary. Parenthetically, I should mention that this is why the St. Paul Center has three times a year a priest's conference in January in California, in April in Austin, Texas, and then in July at Ogle Bay Resort. These resorts are ideal places for priests to have a total immersion in the Old Testament and the New. And what makes it so exciting for me is that this year we've had between six and 700 priests go through scripture with me, with John Bergsma, and with a number of others. There you have some images of our priest conferences. And so Dr. Bergsma has a four-volume work entitled The Word of the Lord that is designed to guide homilists in their own preparation to preach, whereas this is designed so that you can find typology in this book, Living, the uh, Breaking the Bread. You find typology here as lay people. And so while we are raising up a new generation of seminarians and priests who are really adept at discerning this pattern of promise and fulfillment in the old and new, whether they apply it or not, or whether you have older clergy who have not yet learned this, the fact is, in 1970, when the new lectionary was promulgated, what Father Cipriano Vagagini put into the whole thing was typology. And I remember talking to my own pastor, who was a seminary professor at the time that it was promulgated. He said, you know, we were so excited by the new lectionary, but none of us were instructed so that the seminarians never really learned how to read the old and the new typologically. And this was some 45, 50 years after the new lectionary was promulgated with a 400% increase in the amount of the Old Testament that would be read on Sundays and feast days for ordinary Catholics. And still the instruction had not been woven into the curriculum of biblical teaching for seminaries. And so we're trying to make up for lost time. We're also having these priest conferences three times a year. This coming weekend, we're going to have a deacon's conference, which we hope to have again next year. 
And in the, you know, in the process of doing this, what we generally sense is that across the board, clergy and laity, young and old, find that this typological reading of sacred scripture is what authenticates the divine authorship. And at the same time, it also authenticates the church's living tradition that enables us to not only stay within the straight and narrow of sound doctrine, but to discover something that is practically speaking inexhaustible, as St. Augustine describes it on Christian doctrine, that there is something there for everybody. We make some suggested connections, but at the same time, we equip people through Breaking the Bread, a biblical devotional for Catholics, for you to read these passages prayerfully on your own, and you're going to come up with some of your own insights as well. Excellent. Dr. Hahn, it's been what a joy, what a pleasure. So thankful for your work and all of your team putting this together. So go to stpaulcenter.com. You can purchase the Ignatius Study Bible as well as the resources regarding the lectionary. And you can go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register if you want to join our Bible reading group. But let's say a Hail Mary to offer this all to Our Lady and ask for her to guide us into the Holy Scriptures. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen.